just a couple of words of introduction. To most of you, the, the situation in Kashmir will be, be well known. Here we have a disputed, a territory that has been disputed since the partition of, of India uh, in 1947, with part of it under the control of Pakistan, Azad Kashmir. I'm not sure you said the control of Pakistan, but I'll, I'll say, express it in that way. And the, the majority of the, the former land uh, under international law having Indian sovereignty. Rel religious divides cementing the differences. The differences over Kashmir have led to three wars between the two countries and in the past couple of decades have led to uh, tens of thousands of deaths in Indian controlled Kashmir all too often at the hands of, of Indian soldiers and perhaps an overreaction some would say to the um, the terrorist problems they have they have uh, encountered but anyway the question for me is, is, and let me just put this in context, because especially so uh, because we have sought some representation from the Indian Embassy here uh, without success. I'm, um, I'll just put my partiality on the table. I am suspicious of Pakistan. I think too, too often Kashmir has been used by Pakistan politicians uh, to uh, appeal to their voters without consideration of the needs of Kashmiri people. Um, and I'm surprised and bemused by India. I do not know why India is so reluctant to talk about the problems of Kashmir when it has resulted in so many deaths of Indian citizens. India would obviously regard its Kashmiris as, as Indians. So many deaths of India, Indian citizens at the hands of, of Indian troops. And, um, and while the, the problems continue. <coughs> I'm just surprised, and I hope we'll have the chance during the course of, of this session to explore the reasons for that, and above all, how we can make progress. How we can make progress in, in bringing together India and Pakistan, and how we can ensure that Kashmiri people have a better future. Thank you. I'll stop there. Um, my colleague, I think, Ivo Weigel, my co-sponsor of this event, will wish to say a few words. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to to uh, first to thank you that you are taking that you are participating to this conference, and I would like to to thank to Chris for initiating it. Uh, if I start with the with the event where I was first, so to say, seriously uh, confronted with the problem of Kashmir. It was when uh, I was visiting India in the time where Slovenia, my country, was not yet, has not yet been recognized as a sovereign state. And uh, we, were, we made a delegation uh, to, 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 in, to New Delhi and uh, in order to get uh, support or recognition. And, uh, when we were attending the press conference after the meetings in the foreign ministry, uh, the first three questions of the journalists were, what is the position of the future state Slovenia to the Kashmir problem? Of course, we didn't have the proper answer, as I don't have the proper answer today. But uh, my motive for to, to participate to, the, to this conference is uh, my starting point is that all the countries involved in the dispute about Kashmir, I mean India, Pakistan and China, are extremely important countries for the future of the planet. For any issue you can choose, but especially for the stability and security of our world and progress, economic and other, uh, on other fields, that we can close the eyes in front of an open question, open problem. You feel it much closer and much more than we do, and therefore you have to have our respect, whatever your position is. Uh, Chris mentioned that he is suspect, suspicious to the one of the players in the in the big uh, big political pa uh, party. 
I am, I would say, I am suspicious about the, all of the players and including the international community, because uh, uh, this problem should not be one of the hidden problem. It is well known, and I think more of engagement of the international community is needed. More of the of the of the constructive and and original uh, solution should be should be applied, including the high grade of the of the understanding of the problems of the local populations you cannot live with a war you cannot live uh, on the long term with the disaster which war is causing so i expect today an uh, open minded exchange of views and uh, the aim only can be to have just another another international debate on how to approach the problem and how to come closer to a negotiated solution. So thank you very much for accepting my my cooperation in this in this <coughs> event. Thank you. Thank you, Ivo. Now we have the room till three o'clock, but I'm very conscious that a number of members will, will leave by by two. So I'll ask the speakers just to bear that in mind when making their cases, because I'd like the chance for some questions uh, for the panel to be able to answer some some of the questions before uh, before that time is reached. So let me start by introducing Barrister Trambu from the uh, Kashmir Centre to say a, a few words of introduction to set the scene. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Ivo. I uh, really am very grateful uh, to the Aldi Group uh, for organising this hearing uh, this morning, and I hope that at the end of the day, we take something from here, as Chris said yesterday in the press conference as well, that he wants to establish the truth. So I hope and I believe that we may be able to do this this afternoon. Now, I would want to make first few preliminary remarks. Uh, for more than six decades, uh, the Kashmir conflict has been knowingly projected as one of the most intractable problems of international politics. In view of the many different, though contradictory, proposals, declarations, and initiatives made from time to time, together with the national and international organization on the matter, it would be preposterous to suggest that the issue of Kashmir is a mission impossible. However, as a true representative of the people of Kashmir, I have the privilege of not being bound by the raison etat of any comment. The, con uh, the conventional diplomatic or tactical approach, however, has solved nothing, particularly in regard to the Kashmir issue. It has left everything in limbo for more than six decades. It's no way sufficient to repeat for the sake of avoiding controversy and not antagonizing anyone again and again commonly accepted principles. After their affirmation and reaffirmation, one has to talk about the conditions for their implementation and finally reach the stage of an actionable program. When talking about future prospects, one must be aware of a historical fact that has become a predicament of all efforts aimed at finding a solution to the problem of Kashmir. The respect to resolutions of the United Nations Security Council are undoubtedly the documents of reference for a durable and internationally accepted solution. This perception has been confirmed at the time of their adoption both by India and Pakistan. The resolution are clearly declaring the people of Jammu and Kashmir to determine their own future through a fair and impartial plebiscite under the auspices of the United Nations. Gandhi, the founder of India, on 30th October 1947 said, and quote, the accession was provisional upon an impartial plebiscite being taken by the Kashmiris, unquote. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India, on 2nd January 1952 said, and quote, we have taken the issue to the United Nations and given our word of honor, and we cannot go back on it. We have left the question of final solution to the people of Kashmir, unquote. However, no steps ever been taken towards the implementation of the resolutions and our commitment made to the Kashmiri people. In order to analyze the situation properly with regard to those resolutions, the policy of double standards, unfortunately, of the Security Council, 
which is intrinsically linked to the veto privilege of the permanent members becomes rather obvious. Nevertheless, in legal terms, lawful expectations have been created as to the possible role of the United Nations as a facilitator of solution to the Kashmir problem. <clears throat> now I would want to deal with the basic requirements which I believe are just and durable for the just and durable solution. Now in view of this historical uh, predicament and developments, particularly as regards the absence of balance of power now that exists at the global level, I would like to outline some of the basic elements of an approach that may allow a just and durable solution the Kashmir to the Kashmir issue and that are well, now as follows. One, the multi-dimensional nature of the problem needs to be acknowledged and that is A, the Kashmir problem is an issue of self-determination which has three parties namely Kashmiris as the principal stakeholders, Pakistan and India. B, it's an issue of basic human rights, which forms part of just cohesions of general international law. And C, it's essentially an, uh, a regional issue, but at the same time, it's a matter concerning the international community as a whole, since it has implications for global peace and security, not the least due to the nuclear potential of Pakistan and India. Two, in terms of people's rights, that is self-determination, a solution to implement the UN resolution has to be pursued on the basis not merely bilateral but by tripartite approach. It's a fact that the question of Kashmir cannot be addressed with, without involving the Kashmiri people. The sticking point has been typically been how to do so indeed. The key, I believe, the demand of Kashmir is that Kashmir should be solved through a meaningful tripartite dialogue. India has refused to accept this thus far. Strictly bilateral approaches to resolving Kashmir have failed all throughout and are likely to do so in future as well. A successful process must include a direct and effective participation of people of Kashmir. What has made Kashmir intractable over the years has been the bilateralism in dealing with the question of Kashmir. It's not a coincidence that every single dialogue and agreement on Kashmir since 1947 share two things in common. They are, <clears throat> they all failed to do bring peace and they all excluded Kashmiris. By involving the people of Kashmir and thereby rehumanizing Kashmir, you automatically dilute the long standing ethos of bilateralism. Three, engaging a fourth party as a mediator and a guarantor of a solution is critical in this regard. The example of United States facilitating role in Israel-Palestinian conflict is not very encouraging. But generally speaking, the only global superpower has strategic interests in every region of the world and hence cannot be ignored. But a regional intergovernmental organization such as the European Union, where we are sitting, in context, of, in context of the Kashmir issue may have a better chance perceived as neutral in this respect. And I would like to draw the attention of the European Parliament's report on this, which has suggested exactly the same thing. <coughs> Four, it has also been realized that nothing can be gained from armed confrontation. Three wars have been fought with no tangible results. Between 2005 and 6, India kept its armed forces on high alert for more than nine months on ceasefire line and international borders with Pakistan. Risk of nuclear engagement could be a probability with disastrous consequences. Five, having said, that it has been, uh, it has be, it has to be made clear that Kashmir issue must not be confused, and I repeat, must not be confused with the issues related to the global war on terror. This is particularly important because in the aftermath of 9/11, the government of India, having attempted to exploit the UN Security Council Resolution 1373 of 2001, has embarked on a massive disinformation campaign through its machinery concerning the freedom struggle of Kashmiri people. It has to be borne in mind the people of Kashmir, frustrated by India's force, and I believe I should use the word fraud, launched a genuine and popular uprising for freedom and peace. Mistakenly, the Indian response is utterly brutal. It's an unequal struggle, unfortunately, bearing in mind that Kashmiris are defying the third largest army in the world. Six. If there is any hope for a solution, for a durable solution, one has to get away from mere police and military approach, battle against the so-called terrorists. And instead of dealing with symptoms, address the root causes of the conflict. 
that are related to the question of self-determination. This may help the parties to get out of the trap that's aptly described by the dictum. And I quote, One's man's, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, unquote. Seven, <clears throat> all parties have to acknowledge that the problem of Kashmir is to be resolved on the basis of respect for international rule of law, including the UN resolution on Kashmir. This commitment has to be seen as, in, in, as an integrated manner. No rule or principle can be picked and advocated in isolation uh, uh, from the others. Now, I will very briefly deal with the measures I believe those are required for realization of Kashmiri's right to self-determination. Uh, in uh, resolution of 24th uh, May 2007, Kashmir, uh, the European Parliament's Kashmir present situation and future prospect, prospects, the European Parliament has rightly acknowledged the positive steps so far taken by both uh, countries, that is India and Pakistan, and encouraged the conflict parties to proceed on the path to peace. The composite dialogue upon which India and Pakistan had embarked just a few years back must be put back on track. At its face value, such engagements are welcome overtures following crisis after crisis on the Kashmir issue. The people of Kashmir, the immediate victims being the central party to the dispute, are most concerned and supportive of any developments. What is important is that an effective element of international facilitation has to be put in place for addressing the issue of self-determination for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And I believe US, EU, and OIC enjoys good communication and relations with both Pakistan and India, and that there is a cooperation for encouraging dialogue and peace in the region. So far, however, in spite of all declarations of goodwill and readiness to negotiate, not much has been achieved in moving forward. What is needed in the historical constellations are bold steps to lead both countries away from the traditional enemy stereotype and tissue of deep mistrust. Most unfortunately, violence continues unabated in IHK. Only over the last 10 weeks or so, 118 young Kashmiri youth uh, between the ages of 9 and 34 have been killed in peaceful assemblies through live ammunition by Indian Central Reserve Police Force. I'm confident that all those present at this hearing will join me in unequivocally repudiate the use of all forms, of, uh, all forms and manifestations of terrorism, including state terrorism. Now, more importantly, therefore, India must seize all forms of hostilities and violence against Kashmiri. It needs to honor the international obligations, such as IC, uh, ICCPR and UDHR, and investigate, as has been asked by the European Parliament through urgency resolution, impartially the mass grave situation and the Shupian rape uh, murder case. In the interim, what needs to be achieved as a short and medium term measures, and which is likely to improve the confidence are the opening of the borders along the CFL must not consist of spor sporadic events only. B, communication lines have to be opened on permanent basis. And C, the moment of, people of, uh, moment of people and goods over the CFL must be facilitated and improved. So far, there has been too much bureaucratic hurdles to these promising practical measures. One more important, just a couple of points, and I will leave it there, sir. Uh, uh, one more uh, on long-term basis, one, uh, one important measure that I feel will take this uh, matter uh, forward that the governments of India and Pakistan need to establish a working group on Kashmir which could allow the effective participation of the Kashmiri representatives. Indeed, it should be this forum we should deliberate on the implementation of self-determination. And I will finally say, therefore, it has to be accepted that the issue of uh, the right of Kashmiri's people to self-determination is not in need of any discussion or debate. In so much, it is in need of work to end obstacles and hindrances which stand in the way of implementing international legitimacy, thereby paving the way for the Kashmiris people to exercise their long-awaited right to self -determination. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Majid. Uh, the, uh, who was being passed notes saying, you know, speed up. <laughs> you you may, have, may, may have noticed you <laughs> accelerated at one point. Lots of detailed stuff there. Uh, just by the way, a comment I've sometimes made to Majid, in the Parliament here, uh, this is an issue which is more often than not, Evo, I think, taken up by, 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 by British representatives. Um, and that's one of the reasons for that is that uh, in, in the United Kingdom we have a, a lot of um, citizens who are of Pakistani origin, but actually many of them are not Pakistani origin, they, they regard themselves as of Kashmiri origin. And it's uh, many, many, many of the politicians in the UK 
um, frequently address this issue at, at, at public meetings. Uh, it would be helpful, given this is a European Parliament, if we had greater numbers of, of uh, representatives from other countries who took a similar interest in the issue. It would help us uh, build the bonds across the, the party and national lines. Thank you. Um, let me move on now and invite Ahmed Khan, the Prime Minister of Azad Kashmir, to address us. Thank you, Prime Minister. Honourable Chris Davis, Member of the European Parliament, Honourable Ivo Wegel, MEP, Honourable Parliamentarians, Analysts, Participants. I feel immense pleasure to be here in the European Parliament's event today. I offer my warm gratitude to my friend, Honourable Member of the European Parliament, Mr. Chris Davis, for inviting me to this important hearing on Kashmir. <clears throat> it is a unique event on equally vital issue of international concern. Myself, the people of Jammu and Kashmir, and Azad, Government of the State of Jammu and Kashmir, are grateful to the entire House of European Parliament and to the European Union for bringing the dispute of Jammu and Kashmir state on their regular review agenda. The mechanism of yearly reportage on the Kashmir situation by the European Parliament is very laudable initiative. That shows the humanitarian concern and commitment to the Kashmiris' right to self-determination. We are grateful for EP involvement. The dispute of Jammu and Kashmir has several aspects to its genesis. It is the most serious and fire-hanging dispute of the mid-20th century. It is international in its dangerous dimensions. It exists in the UN dossiers on disputes yet to be resolved. This dispute is not an isolated issue. It is intertwined into the history of South Asia. It is the core dispute. It took birth from the freedom struggle of the South Asian subcontinent, which now consists of three independent sovereign states, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. Therefore, its, root, its roots are in South Asian affairs. It is linked with the peace, prosperity, and security of South Asian region. Pakistan and India achieved simultaneous independence from the 90-year-old direct British rule. Otherwise, the British presence in the South Asia was of 347 years when they departed in mid-August 1947. The basis of independence of both India and Pakistan was very unambiguous one, and the most likable feature is that it all happened through consensus among the ruling British, Muslim League, and Congress. The formula of partition of South Asian subcontinent was simply the apportionment of the Muslim-majority regions forming Pakistan, Hindu-majority zone constituting Hindustan, India. There are about 565 princes states in the subcontinent. The British Viceroy had suzerainty over those states. Internal functions of the states were autonomous. The state of Jammu and Kashmir, having an area of more or less about 86,000 square miles, was the largest among those 565 states. Being predominantly a Muslim state, it should have joined Pakistan as per the principles of the division of the subcontinent. Muslim majority zones forming Pakistan and Hindu majority regions constituting India, Hindustan. The last British Viceroy, Lord Mount Brighton of Burma, on July 25, 1947, addressing the Chamber of Princes, advised them to join either of the dominions, Pakistan or India, keeping in consideration the geographical contiguity and communal composition. The ruler of Jammu and Kashmir state, Maharaja Hari Singh, meanwhile, offered a standstill agreement to Pakistan. The offer was made on August 12, 1947. Pakistan came into independent being on August 14 and India on August 15, 1947. Pakistan accepted the standstill agreement and conveyed her acceptance to the Maharaja on August 15, a day after her independence. Her acceptance to, Maharaj, to the Maharaja on August 15, a day after her independence. But India, who too was offered the same standstill agreement, did not accept that in case of Jammu and Kashmir. Although she had signed a similar nature standstill accord with another state, Hyderabad. Under the standstill agreement, the subjects of defense, foreign affairs, and communications came under the suzerainty of Pakistan as before they were under the departing British regime. That means, legally, Jammu and Kashmir state on August 15, 1947, had done the mantle of suzerainty of Pakistan. Another vital political development that had taken about a month earlier was the passage of historic resolution on accession of Jammu and Kashmir state to Pakistan. The resolution based on the spirit and principles of the partition of the subcontinent was passed by the state's popular political party, All Jammu and Kashmir Muslim Conference, on July 19, 1947. 
The immediate post-independence scenario of the subcontinent is not that human. Massive communal rights broke out, both in India and Pakistan, and in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The people of Kashmir, who were disarmed earlier by the ruler of state, Maharaja Hari Singh, were left at the butchering will of the anti-Muslim communalists. Only in one province of state, Jammu, over 2,500 Muslims were butchered in the first week of November 1947. The majority was driven out of their homes who took refuge in nearby Pakistan cities and villages of Sialkot, Wazirabad, Gujamala, Lahore, etc. The Jammu Muslim majority was reduced by mass murders into minority. The situation turned worse and it was under the pretext of those rights circumstances that India landed her troops in Srinagar on October 27, 1947, claiming having a so-called instrument of accession of Kashmir with India. The ground facts are that the last ruler of Kashmir, Hari Singh, had fled his capital, Srinagar, on October 27, 1947. The popular revolt had dethroned him. He was deprived of his ruling powers and jurisdiction. He was a fugitive then, taking shelter in his native Jammu town. He was not empowered to sign any instrument of authority, but to speak of a big deed like accession of this state of the state against the will of the people. Resultantly, a big war broke out. The people of Kashmir rose as one against their ruler. India sent her troops to the aid of a fleeing ruler. Then she herself took Kashmir as an international dispute to the United Nations Security Council on December 31st, 1947. The council registered the dispute on January 1st, 1947, setting up a commission known as UN Commission on India and Pakistan, UNCIP. A ceasefire was effected on January 1st, 1947. UN military observers were sent to the scene of war theater. They are functional with their headquarters at Srinagar since 1949. The UN Security Council and the UNCIP resolutions signed both by Pakistan and India as party to the dispute of Kashmir make it obligatory to have an international plebiscite held under UN auspices in Jammu and Kashmir to decide the future affiliation of the state. The legal international obligation, that legal international obligation is yet to complete. Several rounds of regional and bilateral talks between Pakistan and India yielded nothing towards the resolution of this court dispute. India now does not treat that as a dispute despite her signatures on the resolutions of UN, UN Security Council <coughs> and of UNCIP of August 13, 1948 and January 1949. That attitude of India has generated a tragedy into tragedy, depriving the 13 million people of Jammu and Kashmir of their basic right to self-determination. Now the people have once again risen against their deprivations. The ongoing movement in Jammu and Kashmir is quite peaceful and indigenous. For the past over five months, a cruel curfew has been imposed by Indian occupation forces, driving the people to utter starvation, but to speak of schooling or shopping, etc. India treats the running self-determination movement as a law and order situation. She evades the burden of UN mandate in Jammu and Kashmir. As fresh as on September 25, 2008, the Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, in his UN General Assembly address, had declared that India was ready to settle all issues, including of Jammu and Kashmir, through talks with Pakistan. But that pledge, too, remains to be taken up seriously. Kashmiris want a peaceful, negotiated settlement of this dispute. They want their association with the process of talks between Pakistan and India over Kashmir. The resolutions of UN Security Council and of UNCIP provide a non-controversial roadmap as India and Pakistan both are already signatories to those valid UN documents. Kashmir Valley today presents a look of a curfew chamber. Massive human rights violations are a routine there. Kashmiri's leader are not allowed outside travel. Even the chairman of Hurriyat Conference, Mirwaz Umar Farooq, who was invited to participate in the annual meetings of the OIC foreign ministers in UN headquarters in New York on September 22nd and 24th, 2010, was disallowed travel documents. He, with other senior Kashmiri leaders, Sayyid Ali Gilani and Yasin Malik, are under house arrest. Shabir Ahmed Shah is denied medical treatment. The humanitarian situation in Hal Kashmir has reached a point that warrants immediate food aid. The European Parliament can use its good offices to let food be transported into the Kashmir Valley for distribution to the starving masses there. The International Red Cross Committee can play an urgent humanitarian assisting role. On this occasion, I would appeal for immediate food aid action. The genesis of the Kashmir dispute note is appended herewith, which I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Castillo.
I once again offer my thanks for arranging this important hearing on Kashmir. I would suggest that such EP hearings may also be held in both parts of the state of Jammu and Kashmir to hear the people, political parties, and victims of excesses directly. I offer to the European Parliament the facility of a hearing house in Azad Jammu and Kashmir. I had also made an offer to Mr. Elmer Brock, the then, then chairman of the Foreign Relations Com Commission of the European Union, when he, with Mr. James L. Ellis, MEP, had visited us on my invitation in January 2007 for a European Union symbolic presence in Azad Jammu and Kashmir. That facility can increase the frequencies of our mutually beneficial multi sectoral interactive approaches. We seek we seek solution of Kashmir dispute. We seek peaceful, negotiated solution guaranteeing aspirations of Kashmiris. We seek the role of European Union, European Parliament. We wish to see peace and security return to South Asia. An atmosphere of genuine peace and friendship between Pakistan and India and welfare of Kashmiris as part of humanity. Thanks. Long live European Union, Pakistan, Kashmir, visionary friendship. Thank you, Thank you, Prime Minister. Can I move now to um, Ambassador Jilani, the Ambassador for Pakistan? Ambassador, you've heard, and we know of the the, the historic reasons for the, for the dispute. Um, and yet, just a short while ago, a few years ago, it did look as though India and Pakistan were coming together and uh, there, it, there was the possibility of progress being made. And now we seem to have been thrust back into uh, a situation where the political uh, circumstances are, are running dangerously out of control. I wonder if uh, you can comment on, on, these, on, on where we go from here. Thank you very much, Honorable Chris Davies, for organizing this wonderful hearing. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to you for making me a part of this distinguished panel. And uh, I look forward to this very illuminating interactive session that we are going to have this afternoon. I uh, am going to speak on the nature of Pakistan-India relations and the peace process that we had initiated a couple of years ago in order to bring an end to this tension and acrimony that has been the hallmark of Pakistan-India relations for the last <coughs> more than 63 years. The history of Pakistan-India relations has not been a very glorious one. It has not been a glorious one, mainly because of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. A dispute, both India and Pakistan, they are committed to resolve in accordance with the UN Security Council resolutions. When I mention about the UN Security Council resolutions, I feel that the UN Security Council on Jammu and Kashmir, they are different than any other resolution which is on the agenda of the UN Security Council. They are different because the UN Security Council on Jammu and Kashmir were the ones which were accepted by both India and Pakistan and endorsed by the international community. Both India and Pakistan have given a word that they are duty bound to the people of Jammu and Kashmir to give them their right of self-determination. The, of course, when we are talking about the history of nature of Pakistan-India relations, there are many other issues which in recent years have gained prominence. Siachen Glacier issue, 
which is under the illegal occupation of India since 1984, is yet another issue. Sir Creek dispute, this is another issue that we have between India and Pakistan. Water issues, we feel that, Pakistan feels that the Indus Waters Treaty, which forms the basis of the distribution of waters between Pakistan and India, is not being adhered to by India in letter and spirit. And it is being violated with impunity. Terrorism, and of course, nuclear and conventional issues form yet another issues on the list of issues that we are basically, we are discussing. Why is the resolution of these issues so important for both India and Pakistan? I think there are some very serious imperatives which require a resolution of these issues. One, that since 1947, both India and Pakistan, they have tried to manage their relations. Both India and Pakistan have tried to normalize their relations. Series of dialogues had taken place to resolve those issues, but somehow the normalization process remained incomplete. And also, one reason that the normalization, there could be no normalization, was because of the unresolved issue of Jammu and Kashmir and the other issues which are on the table. We have had wars, we have had tensions, and there has been a constant struggle since 1947 to undermine each other. Both India and Pakistan, we have tried to demonize each other and without any results because the issues, they remained issues and no effort to build the level of trust between the two countries was able to produce any results because of these issues that I have just mentioned, because mainly of the unresolved issue of Jammu and Kashmir. However, there is a realization that war is not a solution between Pakistan and India. War is a, not a solution between Pakistan and India because a war between two nuclear neighbors is bound to have catastrophic effects on almost everything that you can imagine. If you look at the history of wars between Pakistan and India, the three wars, the major wars that we have fought, if you ask me, we have literally fought those wars with bows and arrows. But the kind of sophistication that has set in, in, our, in the, the inventory of both India and Pakistan, no country, it is the, any war will have devastating effects. There is also a realization in both India and Pakistan that no country can achieve its economic potentials without addressing the issues and without creating a conducive environment to, to take this economic, to take advantage of the, the massive economic opportunities that are available to both the countries. I remember that when I was posted in India many years ago, those were very tense times in our relations. And I'm talking of the period from 1999 from till 2003. At that level, the level of trade between Pakistan and India was just $300 million, which was absolutely pittance compared to the potential that both countries offer or the region as a whole offers. 
there is a realization that we need to have good neighborly relations. We need to create a peaceful region in a in a in an environment which is which is which requires cooperation by the countries of the region. Then there is also a realization in both India and Pakistan that we need to forge cooperation in order to meet the challenges posed by the unconventional threats. And the unconventional threats include, obviously, poverty, water management, environment, climate changes, population control, and food security. These are the real problems that are faced by our, re our region. Just imagine the level of poverty that exists in our region. If 30 to 40 percent of the population of India alone, if they live below poverty line, and if the same number of people living under poverty line, imagine the kind of population that these two countries have or for that matter, the other regional countries, you can imagine how many people are living below poverty line in these countries. So accordingly, this is this luxury of maintaining this tension between India and Pakistan is something that we can ill afford. In since having this realization, we have since, 19, since January 2004, we were engaged in a peace process. A very interesting phenomena. In January and 2004, when we initiated this peace process, the statement that was issued on 6th January 2004 commits both countries to to resolve the Jammu and Kashmir dispute to the satisfaction of both India and Pakistan and the people of Kashmir. Since 2004, peace process had been initiated. A number of rounds had taken place. Primary issue obviously remained the issue of Jammu and Kashmir. A number of ideas were exchanged, but unfortunately, the process was disrupted recently. It has been revived now, revived, but the initial two <laughs> contacts that were maintained by the foreign secretaries of the two countries or the foreign ministers of the two countries, they remained inconclusive. I will stay very brief on this issue while discussing these issues. I'll just switch to how do we take this process forward? We can take this process forward by building trust and avoiding propaganda. By demonizing each other or by conducting or by in, in our involvement in propaganda against each other, we have not gone anywhere. Secondly, we have no option but to take on the real issues like Jammu and Kashmir, Siachen, Sir Creek, water issues head on. We cannot, we have, we can, we cannot waste any more time in sort of just discussing the issue without resolving it. We have to go beyond the confidence building measures. We have had enough confidence building measures, Kashmir related cosmic confidence building measures, nuclear related confidence building measures that we have agreed upon in the last uh, last couple of years, but now the stage has come that we have to move beyond it. We have to resolve Kashmir issue in accordance with international security uh, legality, security council resolutions, 
and the aspirations of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. We need to adopt a problem-solving approach. Problem solve it. We can't continue with the wooden-headed approach that we have followed for the last many years. This wooden-headed approach have, has taken us nowhere. We have to, we have to ensure that domestic political compulsions should not be allowed to derail the peace process. What again? This is something that we have witnessed over the last many years that this domestic political compulsions or the demands by certain extremist elements who want to disrupt the peace process were given more weightage by the, by the political leadership and the processes were disrupted. This is something that we have to avoid. I will, sir, as per your directions, end here and we can sort of uh, speak further when we have the question on the session. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. This is rare. I really want the Ambassador for um, your opposite number, the Indian Ambassador, to be uh, resp responding so we can have a real dialogue. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> indeed. Uh, it's, it's, in fact, it would be very nice if we could just start peace negotiations here and now, just get it over with by 6 o'clock, maybe. Put, put, put behind us 60 years of history. Let me um, introduce now Shireen Mazari, the editor of The Nation. Shireen, I see, former London School of Economics graduate. That's right. I've got to speak there tomorrow myself. So, oh. so, so. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And um, I have to say, though, I am very fearful that uh, while it's very welcoming that the EU um, is uh, looking more closely into the Kashmir issue, uh, that it does not fall into the same routine of Pakistan and India dialoguing on Kashmir on and off because this is my third uh, visit to the EU Parliament and uh, presenting the case of Kashmir and I hope that it actually moves beyond into some form of action. Um, uh, what we are seeing periodically in um, what we refer to as occupied Kashmir or Indian held Kashmir is the outbreak of violence and uh, in different forms, but it, it, is, it is the same manifestation uh, of the Kashmiri struggle. And the struggle over the last, over six decades, is to rid themselves of Indian occupation. Um, a new generation presently has taken up the struggle. The youth have come out on the streets with stones, a sort of Kashmiri intifada, if you will. And from 11th June till the first week of October, over 110 Kashmiris had died, 3,000 had been injured, and as of yesterday, Kashmir, uh, Indian held Kashmir is totally sealed again so that nobody has access to the brutalities that are going on. <clears throat> By any definition, this is a basic human rights problem. And as we have seen the international community talk about humanitarian interventions and the idea that uh, you can't uh, use the issue of sovereignty to conceal human rights abuses or justify them. So the issue that uh, arises is, why is there such a strange international silence on what are very clearly evident human rights abuses on the part of the Indian government? Um, that is something that is of concern, uh, certainly to us in Pakistan and uh, should be of concern to the international community and especially within the EU, which has such a strong uh, record of defense of human rights um, and has been proactive in intervening on the, this particular issue across the globe. And yet we don't see that intervention in, uh, the, on the issue of Kashmir. So uh, that is one issue. The second uh, point I want to make is that every time there has been an uprising, indigenous uprising in Kashmir, regardless of what may follow later, the government of Pakistan at least has been caught napping. Whether it was in 89, end of 88, 89, it took the Benazir government then two months to make a response to what had started happening in occupied Kashmir, uh, the struggle there. And again, when the present struggle uh, arose, unfortunately, um, our government is still thinking of uh, cohesive responses. 
So the accusations that keep coming about how Pakistan engineers all these uprisings in occupied Kashmir were that the Pakistani state was so powerful and effective, but unfortunately that is not the case. This is not to deny that in earlier indigenous struggles, Pakistan has not given support. Uh, Pakistan is, and this is a point that should not be forgotten, is an equal party to the dispute, as is India. <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, uh, on this issue, I want to uh, just highlight a point which people tend to forget. India took the case of Kashmir to the United Nations, not under Chapter 7, where it would have gone declaring Pakistan an aggressor, but under Chapter 6, which is peaceful resolution of disputes, and so right from the start, the assumption that India gave was that this is an international dispute between two members of the United Nations, Pakistan and India. So there is the Indian argument now about how this is an internal matter is absolutely absurd because India itself recognized the international nature of the dispute when it took it to the UN under Chapter 6 and not under Chapter 7. I think that is a very important point that is often forgotten. <clears throat> the other point is that the present uh, uprising, I think even the most violent conspiracy theorists who see Pakistan's hand everywhere will not be able to attribute the latest outburst in any way to Pakistan. Um, it is a youthful leadership, as I said. And unfortunately, the Indian responses have been predictable. Arresting of Kashmiri leaders, uh, attempts at farcical dialogues that tried to offer an all-party conference um, to the Kashmiris uh, in occupied Kashmir, that failed. Then an Indian parliamentary delegation was sent to occupied Kashmir, and they were met with a total protests and no cooperation at all. And now, of course, the usual sealing of uh, Indian occupied Kashmir. So that the and this is, of course, in preparation for Obama's visit to India, uh, lest something uh, untoward happen. So let's the Indians of logic, obviously, being let's see if we can quell. Uh, the uprising with a massive use of force, and let's not let not the outside world get to know what is happening. CBMs have not worked, um, uh, and CBMs will not work on Kashmir because CBMs uh, are not moving either party closer to resolution of the conflict. It's a way of managing the conflict, and it's not going to work. You know, you've had bus uh, travel routes open between the two sides of Kashmir. You've had um, you, the Pakistanis had started inviting all the Kashmiri leaders from occupied Kashmir to Pakistan. Indians have not reciprocated, of course, but in any case. But nothing is going to work, and nothing is going to work because the Indian starting point is an obdurate one. It is not grounded in any legality, and that is that Kashmir is an internal issue and India will deal with it in accordance with the Indian constitution. It is not an internal issue. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir in no way is part of the Indian constitution after it went to the UN Security Council, the issue. And ironically, even the sort of uh, the politicians of Kashmir who were supported India or who were built up by India, like Umar Abdullah, have only last week now, Umar Abdullah, in the Kashmir, uh, occupied Kashmir assembly, made a statement that Kashmir was not an integral part of India and it was a dispute between India and Pakistan, which is an enormous shift. Um, uh, and it shows how within Kashmir now, there is almost no voice that supports uh, the myth that uh, Kashmir is part of the Indian Union. Um, well, why, uh, the, uh, do they, why the Indians continue to propagate it is something uh, uh, which one can't comprehend. But the fact of the matter is it's a lost argument. It really does not hold any water at all. The other issue, of course, is that only the UNSC resolutions will allow the world to establish what the Kashmiris really want. I mean, there's a big debate that Kashmiris don't want to go to Pakistan. They want azadi, you know, freedom. Uh, 
we don't know because they've not been allowed to exercise their right of self-determination. What we do know, however, is that no Kashmiri wants to remain under Indian occupation. That is the starting point. What the Kashmiris want has to be ascertained through UN resolutions. Um, I am not a spokesperson of a government and have not been of any government. As a Pakistani who has been analyst on strategic issues, I've looked at Kashmir for a long time. And many in Pakistan feel, and this is the Pakistani official stated position also, that we will go with whatever the Kashmiris want. So if the Kashmiris want to be given the third choice in a UN plebiscite, so be it. But the fact of the matter is, Pakistan and India have to be brought together to work out the modalities of the plebiscite. What will be included, that's the next stage. India has to agree to allowing the UN to hold the plebiscite. And it is not an intractable problem, nor is it unique. The East Timor issue was identical, and uh, I've done the research on that, to the Kashmir issue in the UN and how it progressed. So if the East Timor issue of self-determination could be resolved by the United Nations, there is absolutely no reason why a simple issue of giving the Kashmiris their right of self-determination is also not allowed because we have to remember Kashmir is not a territorial dispute. It is a dispute about the right of self-determination, which again is very central to the whole uh, new European concept. You know, uh, the idea of self-determination, as far as I know, has been very important in European history. And therefore, I think the Europeans should be much more uh, sympathetic to this issue than maybe the Americans. I don't know. The third point that needs to be made is much has been said, well, you know, India and Pakistan, when they signed the similar agreement, effectively, uh, I'm just going to finish, uh, effectively left out uh, the um, UN and wanted to resolve it bilaterally. Not correct at all. Anybody who reads the similar agreement, and I don't have time to read it, but I'll refer you to it, Article 1.1, Article 1.2, which is very important because it says that till the issue is resolved, neither side can change the status quo unilaterally. So my argument is when India took over, altered the line of control in 1984, it took over some heights and so on, and the line of control was redrawn, it effectively uh, undermined and destroyed the similar agreement to begin with. If you look at Article 6, it talks about principles of the UN Charter, Article 4.2, which again uh, refers to not altering the line of control. So the point I'm trying to make is that this is also a misperception that somehow Simla removed the UN position on Kashmir. No, it did not at all. It reaffirmed it and it said that issues should be, even the bilateral relationship must be defined in terms of the UN Charter and the principles of the United Nations. This is right in the preamble of the Simla Agreement. So I'm afraid that is a myth also, that somehow Pakistan abandoned its position on the UN because of the Simla Agreement, not at all. Uh, I've already made the point about Pakistan being an equal party to the dispute, but I want to make another plea. Why should the Kashmiri people suffer because of the sins of omission and commission by the various Pakistani governments relating to Kashmir? Should the Kashmiris be subject continuously to human rights abuses and denial of their right of self-determination because of Pakistan government failures or Pakistan government's uh, uh, questionable policies? That is the issue. Why should the Kashmiris be made to suffer? Uh, uh, and for the international community, finally, I think the choice is simply this, ignoring the legitimacy of the Kashmir cause and human rights violations by India to please India and retain access to its large markets. That's what it boils down to. The problem is, unless the international community pushes for the resolution according to UNSC resolutions and the principle of self-determination, there will be continued instability in the region and also growing radicalization of the populations. There is a need to realize there can be no solution to the problem of Kashmir within the Indian constitution or without the participation of the three parties to the dispute, Pakistan, the Kashmiris, and India. Generation after generation is growing up with violence and hatred, denied their normal life, no access to proper education, 
and the situation is going to get worse because for the first time the Kashmiri women have come out of their homes onto the streets to support the youth and that is again an expansion upping of the ante of this freedom struggle against India that needs to be realized the role of the women that is going to now be central in the struggle to get rid of Indian occupation so at the end of it Pakistan and India relations, whether we like it or not, the parameters of this relationship are defined by Kashmir. Uh, Musharraf tried to get away from it. Zardari tried to run away from it. It has not worked. Kashmir brings you back to point zero again. Till the Kashmir issue is resolved, there can be no normalization of relations between a nuclear Pakistan and a nuclear India. But the issue is not simply that it should be resolved because of this. It should be resolved because it's a human rights issue and a basic issue of self-determination of a people. Everywhere in the world, the people have got their right of self-determination. Why are the Kashmiris being denied theirs? And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yes, well, as a liberal, I think I'm always in favor of self-determination for, 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 for people, so I, I can agree to that. Um, just two things prompt me. First, first of all, just you, you did say in passing, Shireen, that um, you know, no Kashmiri wants to live under Indian rule. But of course, you know, there's the Hindus in Jammu, so it's not, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not quite as clear-cut as that, is it? you need to give them the right to... I, I, indeed, indeed. But there's one point, Chris, which you mentioned that Pakistani leaders, I mean, Pakistan is guilty of many sins. But I, I, I want to... consensus on issue so the but if you look at the record no politician in general elections actually talks about Kashmir the, the other point is, is, is prompted that during the course of the discussion we've heard many references to United Nations resolution this or that was passed or that was passed you know. and I'm very conscious of, of an expression that's been doing the rounds of this Parliament for some reason over the last few weeks which is attributed to Bismarck which is the uh, that the public there are two things the public should never be allowed to see one is the making of sausages, <laughs> and two is the making of laws, because in both cases it's very messy, unpleasant business. And I've now been in this parliament for long enough to have some laws I approved ten years ago now coming back and being re-looked at. And I'm thinking, did I really sign up to that ten years ago? So when, you know, some of these some of these things that were United Nations resolutions and the wording drawn up by diplomats in the middle of the night. When you look at them 30 years ago, you know, they, they can't really be held up as tablets of stone. You know? We just have to deal with things as they are. Anyway, this is my comment. Now, we've heard a lot, from, if you like, from one side, uh, from the Kashmir people's side and the Pakistan side. And um, so it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce General Mehta, who, well, thank heavens you're here, really, to provide some balance. And I think I said at the beginning that I'm just a bit bemused by the Indian position. Um, it's just, uh, I, I recognize just how inflammatory some of the actions that have taken place in Kashmir have been from the Indian position over the decades. But you know, we have this continuous killing of people in Kashmir, the continuing unrest, and this very huge, heavy military presence, which almost seems to create a, a backlash. And, you know, it just doesn't seem, the, and, and the difficulty then in, 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 in proceeding with diplomatic negotiations, it all just seems, just, just as though we have we have constant stalemate, and and yet there was a clear need for progress. Thank you. Over to you. I'm not going to be provoked by that last statement. Um, Chris, thank you so much uh, to the older group for inviting me. I'm reminded of. Uh, what Zulfikar Ali Bhutto famously said, that one Pakistani is equal to 1,000 Indians. I think that figure has come down today. Um, I would like to add, before I make uh, my formal presentation, that in my biodata, what is missing is the fact that I am also the convener for the last 10 years of the India-Pakistan uh, track two and most recently the convener of the India-Pakistan-Afghanistan trilateral. And I am therefore a friend of Pakistan, a friend of the Kashmiris, and as through this vehicle of the, the bilateral and the trilateral, tried to promote peace and friendship. 
Um, I have two options. One is having heard so much from my friends from Kashmir as well as Pakistan is to try and address the issues they have raised. I think that will be an impossible task in the time allotted to me. And the other option is to go ahead with my formal presentation. I was a bit intrigued by the topic chosen for this presentation, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Well, as I have observed, and I suppose the same charge can be leveled against me, the truth is always a commodity that is used selectively, and the spin put on it is the spin that you desire. So it is selective interpretation and selective projection of the truth as, you know, we picked out elements from the UN Security Council resolutions. And of course, there also has been some factual misrepresentation, but I'm not going to go into that. So here I go, Chris. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir became an integral part of the Indian Union in 1947 through its accession on 26th October 1947 in accordance with legal framework determined by the British Parliament for the independence of the Indian subcontinent. This was completely valid by the Government of India Act 1935 and through the India Independence Act 1947. You're blaming Britain now, are you? Yes, of course. <laughs> in fact, in fact, if I might add, Britain was principally responsible for leaving Kashmir the way it left Kashmir, but we can discuss this later in the evening. Um, the, as a result of international law, the accession was total and irrevocable. The accession was supported by the National Conference, the largest political pa party at the time in the state, and accepted unconditionally by Lord M Mountbatten. The accession was complete with the offer and acceptance. Now, question on plebiscite. On 1st January, at India's behest, UNSC took cognizance of Pakistan's armed aggression. Uh, nobody mentioned this, that uh, even before the accession was signed, on 20th October, uh, the armed aggression by tribals had taken place. An, Ill an illegal occupation of Indian territory of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. India was the complainant before the Security Council against Pakistani aggression. UNSC was appointed the UN Commission for India and Pakistan, and on 13th August 48, adopted a resolution divided into three parts. This is important. The first part called for a ceasefire. The, rec the second part called for Pakistan to withdraw its nationals and tribesmen and to vacate territory occupied by it. After these two conditions were fulfilled, please remember, after these two conditions were fulfilled, India was to withdraw bulk of its forces from the state, leaving behind adequate number to ensure that the government of JNK maintains law and order. Part three of the resolution, which was to be implemented after parts one and two had been stated that both India and Pakistan had reaffirmed their wish that the future status of Jammu and Kashmir shall be determined in accordance with the will of the people. Absolutely right. Uh, even after 63 years, Pakistan has neither implemented the first two parts of the first resolution, nor vacated territory seized by it. it this is also important. India's acceptance of the UNCIP resolutions was subject to several conditions and assurances given by the United Nations Commission on India and Pakistan included that, one, Pakistan would be excluded from all affairs of JNK. Number two, Azad Jammu and Kashmir government would not be recognized. Sovereignty of Jammu and Kashmir government over entire territory of state shall not be brought into question. Four, Territory occupied by Pakistan shall not be consolidated. And five, Pakistani troops would be withdrawn completely. Pakistan never fulfilled these assurances. The preconditions for plebiscite were never fulfilled by Pakistan. The offer was certainly made. It was not taken up, and so 
It cannot be held for generations over the heads of those who made it. On 5th February 1964, India's permanent representative in UNSC said, I wish to make it clear that under no circumstances can India agree to the holding of a plebiscite. Mr. Gunnar Jaring and Frank Graham, both UN representatives involved with Kashmir, had in their reports in 1957 and 58 expressed doubts about reconstituting status quo of 1947-48 for conduct of plebiscite. The offer, therefore, was time and context specific. 63 years after partition, the ground situation has considerably changed. Pakistan unilaterally ceded a part of territory under its illegal occupation to China in 1964, where China today has deployed 7,000 troops. Number two, Pakistan has affected major demographic changes by settling non-Kashmiris. Number three, it has illegally incorporated Gilgit Baltistan into Pakistan. Number four, Pakistan-sponsored terrorism in JNK has forced minority Kashmiri pundits to migrate out of the Kashmir Valley. And the last point, is in reference to UN resolutions on Kashmir did not come under Chapter 7. Absolutely right, as Shareen has said. And, and the UN Charter, because it is not under Charter 7, Chapter 7 is not enforceable, unlike East Timor. Kofi Annan has made this statement in Chaklala in February 2001. In fact, when he came to India, the word he used about the UN resolutions was that it is not implementable. When Mr. Majid Trambu held a conference here in 2008, during a lunchtime address by a very eminent speaker whose name I forget, he made specific reference to self-determination. And he said, in fact, he pointed out the difficulties about self-determination about Kashmir. It's a separate matter, he said, that in Jammu and Kashmir, they have had elections every five years, and so they are determining their future. This is what this gentleman said, and you can check your records. Now, I come to this issue of cross-border terrorism. Pakistan has not seized direct and indirect use of force to wrest Jammu and Kashmir since 1947. In 1965, Pakistan again sought to foster an insurgency, but on failing to suborn the lo local population, infil infiltrated armed troops in the state, leading to war. In 1971, under threat of an armed uprising in East Pakistan, it sought to divert attention by extending the conflict to Jammu and Kashmir. This led to defeat and breakup of Pakistan and creation of independent Bangladesh. After the military defeat and Simla agreement, Pakistan maintained calm in Jammu and Kashmir in 1990, till 1990, when it raised number of terrorist groups to launch a proxy war to secure Pakistan's terms on Jammu and Kashmir. In fact, between, 1980, between 1975 and 1988, there was no uh, offer or the, the question of Jammu and Kashmir lay dormant. Neither side raised the issue. Cross-border terrorism became an instrument of state policy, but not excluding conventional methods as demonstrated by Pakistan's military operations in Kargil, in Jammu and Kashmir in 1999, when it sought to repeat 1948 and 1965. Only last week, former president of Pakistan, General Parvez Musharraf, said he did not regret doing Kargil as a means of putting pressure on India to talk on Kashmir. In 2001, one of the terrorist groups based in Pakistan launched an attack on India's parliament. And in 2002, on the brink of war with India, President General Parvesh Musharraf, on 12th January 2002, on 27th May, twice, twice pledged to end cross-border terrorism. And on the latter occasion, through the United States, 
said that it would be ended, and please note, permanently, irreversibly, visibly, and to the satisfaction of India. Then again, on 6 January 2004, my friend, my dear friend, Mr. Uh, Jelani, who, with whom I shared some very interesting time in Delhi, said that is a statement on 6 January, it's a joint statement uh, during the SARC summit at Islamabad, General Musharraf assured Prime Minister Vajpayee that, and I quote, he will not permit any territory under Pakistan's control to be used to support terrorism in any manner. In November 2008, Mumbai happened, leading to international uproar about Pakistan-sourced and state-aided terrorism. This time, foreign nationals were involved, and so there was this huge uproar. Altogether, 14 terrorist attacks sourced in Pakistan were launched between 2001 and 2008. Even the Australian uh, Prime Minister mentioned this about the Commonwealth, during the Commonwealth Games. These have undermined India-Pakistan relations. Pakistan has consistently denied involvement of the state in non-state actors. It says it too is a victim of terrorism, except, except that it is being struck by its own people, or as many Pakistani friends say, that now, our own pets have started biting us. Earlier this month, in one week, there was the following evidence of Pakistan's direct or indirect involvement in terror against India. First, General Musharraf's interview to Der Spiegel on 1st October. He admitted that Pakistan trained terrorist jihadi groups to operate in Kashmir to put pressure on India to discuss Kashmir. This is the right of every country to support its national interest, he added. He defended Pakistan-based Lashkar Taiba for defending the rights of the Kashmiri people. Number two, Interpol issued two red corner notices. All this happened last week against five Pakistani nationals, including a retired and two serving Pakistani army majors for their direct role in the Mumbai terror attacks. The officers are named. Two others are the commanders of Huji, and that is Elias Kashmiri and Lashkar terrorist Sajid Mir. For the first time, Pentagon spokesman Colonel David Lapan told reporters that some members of Pakistan IISI might be interacting with terrorist organizations in ways, in ways that are not consistent with what the government is saying or doing, that is the Pakistan government. And last, both Army Chief General Kayani and ISI Chief General Shuja Pasha have said in interviews to Der Spiegel that certain Pakistani terrorist groups are our strategic assets. Now the current unrest in Jammu and Kashmir. Since June 2010, the unrest in three districts of Srinagar Valley has led to more than 100 civilian deaths, largely youth, as was brought out, and imposition of curfew and restriction in most parts of the valley. That India blames all the trouble and unrest in Kashmir to the ISI has become a cliche. But there is sufficient evidence to suggest that after the insurgency in Jammu and Kashmir, especially the valley plateaued around 2008-9, a new strategy had to be evolved to keep the pot bo boiling and keep the Kashmir issue alive. Separatists in Kashmir, together with the militants, were asked to replicate the Palestinian model of the Intifada to make the unrest and an indigenous struggle. Besides youth and women, Pakistani handlers, separatists, and pro-Azadi freedom elements are mixed up in the crowds. Stone pelters pelting sharp rocks are paid up to six euros for the day and are guided by a calendar of protests issued by separatist leaders, Mr. Saeed Shah Jilani and others. S certain mobs have resorted to surrounding and attacking army, state and central police camps. 
They threatened to attack the army too, but desisted from doing so. Nearly 4,000 security force personnel, 504 civilians were wounded in the street violence over the last three months. Local state administration, state and central police forces, and central and state leadership have severely mishandled the unrest, especially on measures of crowd control. The situation has been diffused by an eight-point action plan to restore normalcy, ensure justice and accountability, affect calibrated demilitarization, and resume the internal dialogue process with all sections of Jammu and Kashmir for addressing their social and political grievances. In addition, a number of conferences among members of civil society have been held so that a consensus political demand can be made by the people of Jammu and Kashmir. As no political plan in Jammu and Kashmir can be viable without involving Pakistan, resumption of the bilateral dialogue at the earliest is essential, and this, I believe, is underway. Kashmir enjoys special status under Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. It is the only state it is the only state which has its own constitution and privileges not avail available to other Indian states of the Union. The Indian constitution has the elasticity to accommodate the political aspirations of the people of Jammu and Kashmir in pursuance of promises made to them in 1952 and 1975. Jammu and Kashmir also needs the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. India has been very humane in its treatment of Kashmiri separatists providing them political space despite their abrasive anti-national posture. They travel abroad, raise funds, and meet India's external adversaries in its own capital city, except that uh, Farooq wasn't allowed to go during the OIC meeting now. India rejects categorically the right to self-determination by Kashmiris. Other, other than that, sky is the limit. The three voices heard in the valley are Azadi, autonomy, and self-governance. The first priority in Jammu and Kashmir is to get a government of reconciliation, and all mainstream parties must come up with a minimum political package. I say a few words on, uh, on, on human rights. The Indian Army, by the way, is not involved in crowd control and not responsible for a single civilian casualty during the ongoing unrest. As someone and that's myself, who has spent 15 of my 40 years in the military along the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir, from Jammu to Leh, and after retiring, traveled along the military fencing from Jammu to Punch, I can assure you that the Indian Army has learned its lessons on human rights, the law of the land, and rules of insurgency for winning the hearts and minds of the people, but that's not enough. We have a long way to go. The Indian Army has followed the policy of minimum force, and I'd like you to, 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 to please note this. Minimum force in good faith, never in the history of insurgencies anywhere, have, that the Indian Army has never used artillery, heavy weapons, or the Air Force. Never, not even once in JNK, except helicopters once in Punch. If you compare this with Pakistan Army or the Chinese Army, Pakistan Army is heavy hand in Baluchistan, Gilgit Baltistan, Fata, or other armies who have used all kinds of uh, weapons, then you will see the difference. Yes, fake encounters have taken place in Jammu and Kashmir, including the Machal, which is now being investigated. I do not shy from admitting that. Uh, the Indian political and democratic structure and provision for the contribution provide firm guarantees for promotion and protection of human rights and, uh, and its citizens. I have a few statistics, and I want you to give those statistics to you. These relate to allegations of human rights against the uh, army from 1994 to 30th September 2010 in Jammu and Kashmir. Allegations received were 988. This figure is up to 30th September uh, la, la, this year. Uh, allegations received 988, allegations investigated 965, allegations under investigation 23, allegations found baseless, false 940, allegations found true 25, persons punished 25, and 
compensation. The officers, 22 officers and 37 officers below officer rank were dismissed with life imprisonment. I leave, I leave this here and come to my, just my concluding part. India has been pretty generous with Pakistan over the last 63 years. It gave up the military option in 1947 when rather than expelling Pakistan invading forces from Jammu and Kashmir, it appealed to UN for a political settlement. In 1965, India again chose political route, even restoring the strategic Haji Pir Pass and point 13620 in Kargil to Pakistan. Uh, to Pakistan. In 1971, despite a comprehensive military victory, India did not force a resolution of Kashmir on its terms. India's remarkable restraint was demonstrated post-Kargil post and attacks against parliament and Mumbai. India is willing and ready to resume talks. Both India and Pakistan face common internal security threats, from homegrown ter terrorism to lack of human security. Not only have the two kept each other down, but also put the rest of the region in an economic rut. India-Pakistan differences have brought in external players to the detriment of South Asia oneness. Whatever the dispute or difference in Afghanistan or elsewhere, it is suggested that Kashmir is the silver bullet to end all problems. But is that really so? Or are there other more deep seated issues. In 2000, General Parvez Musharraf told a Rotary Club meeting that even if Kashmir issue was resolved, India-Pakistan relations would not normalize altogether and automatically. By the way, in 2007, India and Pakistan came very close to a mutually acceptable settlement of Jammu and Kashmir, so close, so close that only Signatures were required if it had been up front. And the details of these were available. That means a Kashmir resolution is doable. It is eminently doable if both sides have the politi political will to do it. What kind of Pakistan does India want? A vibrant democracy with the army under civilian control. During his Lahore visit to Minare, Pakistan, Prime Minister Vajpayee said that a stable, secure, and prosperous Pakistan was in India's interest. The loudest cheer at the ongoing Commonwealth Games during the opening ceremony March past, next to the host team, was for the Pakistani contingent. Indian and Pakistani troops, and I know this, have come to each other's rescue on UN missions. I believe if Pakistan stops cross-border activities in Jammu and Kashmir, peace can prevail and lead to a negotiated settlement in Jammu and Kashmir. I thank the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe for inviting me and you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and patience. Thank you. General, I think you've said a lot of things that needed saying, and, and uh, I'm glad, glad they've been said, but there's also a number of things there that would be regarded as deeply controversial with uh, others here. Um, one of which is that, uh, while, while, while personally I, I, I entirely accept that India was greatly provoked by uh, terrorist attacks of one kind, the reaction, it struck me, from, from, from the Indian, Indian side has led to the deaths of, of many civilians, and the figure is grossly disputed. I've seen figures, I think even from the Indian side, saying that there have been 30,000 deaths in Kashmir, of which a significant proportion must be civilians, um, some of whom killed, were killed by terrorists, some of whom appear to have been killed in large numbers by, by Indian forces. Um, I've seen even figures that take that above 100,000. But I'm not, you know, one of the, what, if, if anyone can quote, can, can, can give the sources of, these, of, of this data, because it is it's one of the points about this seminar, really, that the, the, the facts are, are disputed. Um, so I, I invite people to comment on that. But also, just on this, on the, uh, just to take this forward, you just said that an agreement is doable. Well, what would be the terms of the agreement? Is it, you know? you Can you know? If yes, I'm looking. I'm inviting any others. Other than, I have an ambassador here, so, so I just thought he might know that this. The, the, well, the, the the general referred to um, how close India and Pakistan have come to. To, to reaching an agreement on the future of Kashmir. 
And I just wonder well, what, 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 would, what would be the basis of that that might unite the two countries? Uh, well, let me tell you that I have been uh, part of uh, this dialogue process for a long time. And my recollection is that the issue, the Jammu and Kashmir dispute, has been discussed, as I mentioned, it was the primary issue in our discussions in the last seven, eight years. But to say that we were coming close to a resolution of the, uh, this dispute, um, I, would not, I would not really um, um, uh, say that we were coming close to the resolution of this dispute. For the simple reason that um, there were a number of ideas which were exchanged. The basic parameters of our discussions remained the UN Security Council resolutions. But certainly we were looking at various options which were basically came to a resolution of this dispute which was satisfactory to India, Pakistan, and the people of Kashmir within the confines of the parameters that were set by the UN Security Council resolutions. The discussions certainly remained inconclusive. We, at the official level, the, I was part of the official dialogue process. Our position remained that the issue could only be resolved in accordance with the UN Security Council resolution and in accordance with the aspirations of the people. But certainly, um, India had a position which was entirely different from, from that um, uh, position that was being articulated. Um, I would certainly like to respond to a number of I things. To so comment on that, uh, on that issue. Yes, let, me, let me finish it. I, I just wanted okay. to respond to two or three more points that you had just mentioned in your um, uh, intervention, your presentation. One, you, uh, uh, General Mehta uh, argued that the plebiscite could not be held in, in Jammu and Kashmir in accordance with the UN Security Council resolutions because of the non-implementation of certain obligations by Pakistan, uh, which were given in the UN Security Council resol resolutions. To tell you the truth, the UN Security Council resolutions, if you read those resolutions carefully, they imposed obligations on both India and Pakistan. I would not really like to go into the debate as to which party did not fall certain part of the, res uh, the, the resolution or other party. I, I can say that India did not uh, uh, fulfill certain parts of its obligations. You can say that Pakistan did not uh, fulfill certain parts of its, its obligations. But my point is that is this a, is this a val valid argument? Is this a sufficient reason to deny the people of Jammu and Kashmir for the last 67 years uh, their legitimate right of self-determination that had been promised to them? And then, you know, we are talking about a situation that existed in the 40s whereby you say that, uh, that Pakistan did not fulfill its part of the obligation in, in, the, uh, you know, in 49 or 50, but then the Prime Minister of India is on record as having, a, having made a commitment on the floor of the Indian Parliament that, that India is committed to holding a, 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 a plebiscite in, 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 um, in Jammu and Kashmir, and this is a promise that he repeatedly made to the people of Jammu and Kashmir, which was never fulfilled, one. The other thing that, uh, that has been mentioned, that 110 people who have been recently killed, Pakistan was involved. This is perhaps for the first time in this forum that we are hearing. All independent organizations, accounts even by Indian academics, impartial Indian observers, they have admitted that this was, this is an indigenous intifada, as was the case in the uh, in '87 when it was indigenously started. There is absolutely no proof of any involvement of any external element, or even Pakistan involvement has been has been uh, substantiated or proved, except for certain elements from India. Uh, you read the accounts of all independent uh, organizations, the media accounts, they all say, even the Indian newspaper, Indian ch television channels, they have been advocating that this has been a purely indigenous uh, uh, intifada. 
uh, which started because of the denial of their, their, uh, their right. Mumbai attacks, Mumbai attacks, to tell you the truth, where, you know, when this in attack on the Indian parliament took place, I was posted in Delhi at that particular time. We offered joint investigation of the, of the incident. It was denied by the Indian side. We had offered that we can send our team of investigators who would, because at that particular time also accusations, certain accusations were made against Pakistan. We offered joint investigation, but the same thing was denied. In the case of Mumbai attack, I think Mumbai offered a very good opportunity for both India and Pakistan to forge a cooperative mechanism. As a matter of fact, a mechanism already exists between Pakistan and India to investigate the kind of attacks which have taken place in India. We, Pakistan, has offered its maximum cooperation maximum cooperation that Pakistan will punish those in case sufficient evidence, the evidence which can stand in a court of law, that is provided to, to Pakistan, but that evidence has not so far been provided to Pakistan. And I, I want to go on record that recently, the interaction that has been made by, by, uh, between Pakistan and India, we have again offered, we have again requested that the entire evidence should be shared with us so that we are able to fully uh, to, to, to uh, investigate the matter. One more thing that I would like to mention here, uh, terrorism, Pakistan, accusations have been made against Pakistan for involvement in terrorism. We think this is, in my intervention, this is the same thing that I mentioned, let's not indulge in propaganda. Let's get to real issues. You did this, I will say you did this. With this, is what, this is what has been the history of Pakistan-India relations. This is what have, has been happening. Uh, you throw uh, Mumbai at us, us, we will throw 101 things on you. We will, uh, we will bring in uh, Baluchist, your involvement in Balochistan. The, exactly. the passport, uh, let me share with this, this forum that one of the, the, uh, the uh, one person, Mr. Baram Dag Bukti, who is involved in terrorism in Balochistan, hiding in uh, Afghanistan, has been issued a passport by India. Can you imagine that, that this is the kind of thing which is happening between India and Pakistan? Can you imagine a situation where, whereby tomorrow, Pakistan would issue a passport to the uh, Maoist leaders who are involved in insurgencies in India? What would be the Indian reaction in case a Maoist leader is, is uh, issued a passport by, by, by the Pakistan government? I think this is the, these are the kind of issues, the real issues that we need to grapple. There is absolutely no room for, we have done this for the last uh, 60 years. We have demonized each other. We have inflicted massive harms on each other. Let's not do that. And the last point, General Saab, you mentioned that the, the, the political leadership from the Indian occupied Kashmir are being allowed to travel outside. And I challenge the European Parliament. I challenge my honorable friend Chris Davies to extend an invitation to the political leadership from the, to, to, from the Indian occupied Kashmir to come and speak on this, this forum and I challenge that the permission would be denied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>didn't abide by the conditions. Neither did India, but he forgot to mention that in 1952, December, as a result of neither side implementing that agreement that he referred to, a new uh, resolution was passed where Pakistan was allowed X number of soldiers and India was allowed X number of soldiers. So, I mean, this is how you play around with resolutions, but I thought I'd bring out that there was another resolution following the resolution that he mentioned. And, you know, one can go on on this debate of resolutions, just factually. Yes, um, of course, of course, response. I just came to 1952. I mean, I, I, December I think I, 1952. I'm getting terribly old now, but I, even I wasn't born then. I mean, you know, we've got to move on.
permission? Do I have the permission? So, yes, of course. You had to motion the commission. Uh, yes, of course. Permission. Ambassador, thank you. Thank, 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 thank you very much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this interaction very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. General. My, my dear friend, Jelani Saab is leaving, but uh, uh, the... I, I, uh, <laughs> I am very sorry. <laughs> I, I, I would take this opportunity to, I mean, I obviously cannot and I do not intend to respond to everything Mr. Jelani said, uh, except to go to the first point, that is about how close we were to a resolution on the Kashmir issue. Uh, I'm, you know, what he is talking about is what happened Bit, uh, up front on track one, I am referring to the back channel conversation between a gentleman called Satinda Lamba, a former ambassador, uh, Indian ambassador to Pakistan, and Mr. Tariq Aziz, who was Parvez Musharraf's uh, national security advisor. Uh, there are four versions of how close they were to the Kashmir resolution. The first is by a gentleman who writes for the New York Times, I beg your pardon, for the New Yorker, Steve Cole. The second is by former foreign minister of Pakistan, Mr. Kasuri. The third, again, on the how close they were, what is called the four-point Musharraf formula. And the, and the third, of course, was from Musharraf himself. And the fourth was a story which came out in the Financial Times, the British financial, London Financial Times on 23rd of April 2007. We had a copy of this, dra of this draft agreement and at the Singapore-India-Pakistan conference where a former Foreign Secretary of Pakistan was present, this four-point Kashmir formula, which is known as Musharraf formula, were discussed. The four points were, very briefly, soft borders, maximum autonomy and self-rule for both sides of Kashmir, demilitarization commensurate with, 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 with the levels of infiltration, and the last was joint joint, a joint mechanism for control. Joint control, joint, the sticking point was this fourth issue on sovereignty. How would sovereignty be exercised over the two sides of of Kashmir, and that is where they were stuck. But they, I'm told they came to some agreement on a joint mechanism for control. Now, uh, the, uh, the other point is about uh, the, uh, uh, the Indian passport to Mr. Bukti. Uh, as far as I know, that uh, the government of India has told Pakistan that, look, we have not issued any passport to uh, to, to Mr. Bukti in Afghanistan. If there is, you give us the details, we will scrap the, um, we will can, 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 cancel his, his passport. And you know, in the last, I'm not going into other issues my Mr. Jelani has raised, because I agree with him. Uh, there's no point uh, talking about what has gone by. But on this implementation of UN, UNSC resolution, I think we mustn't forget that the way the UNSCR resolution was drafted or crafted was, it was sequential. One, two, and three. And the third was conditional upon implementation of the first two. And, and, and I think we should stop talking about the UNSCR resolution on self-determination, we should go for this, go for the, as, as far as possible. If, if it is agreeable to the people of India, Pakistan, and Kashmiris on this four-point formula, because this is something that uh, was forged after two years of back-channel negotiation, and I think it is the one that could work. Uh, Musharraf thought of the four points and then post having declared them, 
a meeting was summoned with uh, some of us from the institute, from the foreign office, to uh, try and explain what he had meant by the four points because he hadn't thought them out. And the sticking point happened right at the beginning. How would you define the area of the dispute? And that is the starting point of the problem uh, on Musharraf's four points. So they never went very well. Thank you. Let me just um, bring in Barrister Trambu and then let me extend the, uh, ex open it up. Uh, uh, General Matha referred to 2008 discourse, and I think if his memory uh, will serve right, it was Hans Kochler you were referring to uh, during his presentation, and in, uh, the Prime Minister was also present uh, during that uh, uh, deliberations here. I have luckily his quote here, the General which he said, and I was going to quote as a point eight, but I couldn't get the time. He said, the legacy of the Security Council resolution related to Kashmir is not to be discarded. In spite of the time that has elapsed since their adoption, those resolutions have repeatedly affirmed the democratic principles as basis of a just solution, something which at the time has been fully endorsed by India. The Security Council basic resolution as well as the resolutions adopted by the United Nations Commission for India and Pakistan on 13th August 1948 and 5th January 1949 ought to be recall, uh, recalled in this regard. Almost 10 years after the initial resolutions, Security Council Resolutions 122 of 1957 of 24th January 1957 has reaffirmed the principle stating that, and I quote, the final disposition of the state of Jammu and Kashmir will be made in accordance with the will of the people expressed through the democratic method of, of, of a free, impartial pilbisit, unquote. It is to be noted that this proviso has not become obsolete. This is exactly what he said. Can I just question, question you on that? This plebiscite, do, what choices would, the, would this give the people of Kashmir? Pakistan, India and independence, or just one of the two? Not the two, the, the United Nations resolution. Yeah, yeah, but do, do the people of Kashmir ever get the chance to decide there is no on self-determination? There is no third choice. No? There's no third it, choice? There's no third choice. Yeah, so, 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 anyway, okay. You, sir, yes. My name is Hassan. I'm from Pakistani occupied Kashmir. The, peop, uh, the people are saying here there's an Azad Kashmir. But uh, I'm a political activist, Kashmiri, and basically Kashmiri nationalist. I represent to a certain political and a group also. What I have, uh, I'm, I'm here sitting from uh, one and a half uh, hour, and I'm listening the views and expressions and theories about the Kashmir issue, and the views and uh, views are regarding the ruling elites of the Pakistani occupied Kashmir and the ruling elites of the Indian sides. Both both parties, they are, exp they are. Uh, pleading the case as the internal past of the India and the internal part of the Pakistan. But I haven't heard any views which, which refer to you regarding the common, common masses, common people, of the, uh, common people of the Kashmir. Speakers has mentioned regarding the United Nations resolutions where the genuine Kashmiris think that the United Nations resolutions only serves the interest of the India and Pakistan. Common Kashmiris do not get any basic right from those United Nations resolutions. It is only state of Kashmir should be, should be the part of Pakistan or should be the part of the India. According to our views, we the common peoples of the Kashmiris who are living there, and unfortunately, I, I belong to that family who has the houses in Pakistani occupied Kashmir also, and I have got the families in Indian, Indian occupied Kashmir also. And here is the representing the General Mitra from the Indian side and the Ati Khan side from the Pakistani side. I don't think that General Mitra or Ati Khan knows the views and expressions of the common people of the Kashmiri. And if you want to come on the end, you should analyze the basic, the basic roots of the crisis. What are the, what are the basic roots? for the crisis of the Kashmir. And according to our views and our experiences, we think Pakistan and India should withdraw their troops from the, from the, both, from the both part of the Kashmir. And 
the, this policy of Pakistan and India, both countries, they have the policy to prick India to, uh, to bring on the table, to prick Pakistan to bring on the table for the negotiation. This will not bring any fruitful and prosperous uh, results for the, for the peoples who are living in the South Asia. The military and civil, and, uh, civil establishment, they will keep carry on their, their status, they will enjoy their, and the common people of the South Asia will suffer. And I hope from this conference, from this hearing, there should come a, 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 there should come a result which is which should uh, which should uh, represent the common voices of the people, the people of the Kashmir, not the ruling elites up from the both sides. Got you. Thank you. Next, sir. Yeah. And then yeah, one, two, Lots of people. Can you keep? A host of hands have gone up. So keep your contributions short, please. First of all, I would like to say that General was correct when he said that Kashmir problem is the parting kick of the British Raj in the subcontinent. But there have been some factual inaccuracies which have been said. One of the accuracy, uh, inaccuracy is about accession. Just a few days back, there was a debate in Srinagar Assembly, and the present Chief Minister, Umar Abdullah, in his statement on the floor of Srinagar Assembly said that there has been an accession, but there were conditions for that accession, and there has been no merger. So, uh, and I would not quote Lord Mountbatten, who, st who said when this uh, uh, document of accession, which is a mythological document for the Kashmiris, because that has been proved that it doesn't exist. But still, I say that Mountbatten said that this, uh, uh, this accession will be referred to the people of Jammu and Kashmir, which has not been referred, number one. And the second thing that I would like to say is that Kashmiri's right to self-determination in any discourse, in any discussion, is non-negotiable. We cannot surrender our right to self-determination. There, there must have been, there must have been certain uh, what we call lapses here and there. But ultimately, the problem of Kashmir has to be referred to the uh, to the people of Kashmir, and their aspiration is to be respected. The third thing, can I, sir, can I just ask you? Do you, when you say that, yeah. do you mean that the people of Kashmir should decide between yeah. India and Pakistan sovereignty, or do they have a third option? Because what, 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 what I am saying, it, it has to be, it has to be left, it has to be left. What should be the political future of Kashmir? It has to be left to the people of Kashmir. That is what I say. And the third thing that I want to say is that uh, the report, because uh, International Tribunal for Peace and Justice has issued a report, and they say in Indian occupied Kashmir, there is a militarized governance, military military plus the administration, the Indian administration in Kashmir has intruded into every institution. And there are, uh, and this is a militarized governance, which is a question of conscience for all the, uh, all the international players. And the fourth thing that I, I would like to say is that there is no accountability for the killings that have, that have been conducted. And this has been done in contravention to international law. That's what I have to say about the presentation of the generals. We'll say, General, obviously I'll invite others to come in at the end of the session, but that last point that was made, you, you quoted those, those figures, and there seemed to be an awful lot of complaints and very few people being found, very few, very, very few, I don't know, that's another, you know, it's, it's, I, think, I, think, I, think be, I think people will be suspicious of the figures you quoted, sir. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mr. David. My name is Taul Hakwa, I'm from UK Time London. As uh, uh, Mr. Mehta said, and as Mr. Mehta blaming on Pakistan, sporting terrorism, just want to ask a, a very simple question. Who's sporting uh, in Afghanistan, uh, in Taliban? Who's giving uh, latest weapons? Who's giving a lot of money? And uh, if India not, he can say simply like five-year-old child, he can say no. Second question, whenever Kashmiris, you know, not Pakistanis, whenever Kashmiris talk about their rights, India always talk Pakistan did this, Pakistan did this, Pakistan cut our channels, Pakistan stopped our movies. I mean, 
Where is the Kashmir to Mr. Mehta? He promised me as a Kashmiri that I would be allowed to come into Indian occupied Kashmir. I phoned him about two times to ask him to issue me a visa from Indian government, and he did not answer my phone. So could he explain to me why did we promise last time with me? That's number one thing. And second thing is since we met last time here, I think a few thousand more Kashmiris has been killed by the Indian security forces. So therefore, I would say to Indian government, go India, go. No India, no. Thank you very much. My name is Mohammed Server. I'm a editor of The Nation in London. Since Pakistan and India both are involved in blame game, and that is the reason that nothing can came out in the number of bilateral talks. Would it not be, and it looks that in this given scenario, both the countries would never be able to reach a settlement. Would, would it not be the proper time that European Union, Britain, where I live, and the United States come forward along with the OIC to resolve the Kashmir issue according to the wishes of the Kashmiri people. I am not pleading United Nations resolutions, whatever, the, but given the, within the given scenario, it would be much better with the active participation of the Kashmiris in the dialogue. Without the active participation of the Kashmiris, nothing can come out amicable and acceptable. And the number two, the question is this, that the bilateral talks always create confusion like Agra summit. General Mehta has told that the agreement was about to sign. And that, that is the same case which was endorsed by the Pakistan's former foreign minister, Makhrushid Mahmood Kusuri. But unfortunately, I had a recorded interview with Parvez Musharraf, and he says nothing was so, because none of the Kashmiri leaders were aware about the details of the debt agreement, and it was nothing. And Parvez Musharraf himself told me that we were sorting out the modalities, we were sorting out the issues, but nothing was reached to a certain conclusion phase. Thank you. Can, quick, quick question. Has the UN been involved at all in the bilateral talks between Pakistan and India? No. Uh, no? no. It might be not quite nice if it was, really. Right. Sabra Banu, Gender Concerns International, Den Haag. Uh, would the uh, hearing include reporting on both sides of Kashmir? What the reporting is regarding MDGs, uh, uh, all MDGs, and especially MDG 3 and MDG 5, by the end of 2015? Millennium Development Goals achievements. That is about people's right. That is about women's rights. And this is what the people have now discussed. I also would like to suggest, would the commission and inquiry ask both the governments, or maybe four governments, India, Pakistan, and both the Kashmiris, what is the reporting on CEDA and Commission on Status of Women concerning employment, health, education, and political participation of women in both Kashmir's. And finally, I would also like the Commission, the uh, uh, Liberal Democrats, uh, what is your reporting, what the Commission has done with reference to the 10th anniversary of UNSCR 1325, that UN is celebrating an all international NGO community next month. What is there for Kashmir conflict? We have 
Eight years Talibanization and international community camped in Afghanistan. And there are sessions full on the open debate and United Security, United Nations Security Council about Afghanistan. And there is this conflict for 63 years and we miss mechanism. This is the hearing. This is the truth, General Mehta. Thank you. Yeah, just let me tell members of the panel that we have to be out of this room at three o'clock and we have uh, about 19 minutes. Um, I'm going to ask them all to invite them all to have a, have a last say at the end of the session, but um, I would ask them not to try to deal with all the points that have been raised, too many. People, I'd like to allow people to express their viewpoints, but some of them are, are points of view rather than questions. Um, if you could, when you can make your finishing two minutes remarks, if you could think, you know, where do we go from here? That's, let's, let's, let's finish on a positive note. What are the positive things we could be doing? Okay. Now, I'll take as many questions as I can before I, I bring those in. Um, yes, sir. Uh, then, then, okay. Yeah, my name is Abdul Latif Bhatt. I am editor of KashmirWatch.com. Uh, General Mehta has accepted that HR violations in terms of fake encounters have taken place in Indian occupied Kashmir. So, I uh, uh, question him that why India is not allowing neutral investigations at international level like Amnesty International and other uh, international organizations. Yeah, my question is... Uh, Mr. Mehta, I'm a British... <laughs> Mr. Mehta, I would like to ask something from you. I'm a British Kashmiri journalist who is living here, and I have deep roots in uh, Indian Kashmir uh, and uh, in Pakistani Kashmir as well. So when my brother, who is there, people say he's Indian. One of my sister, who is here, people say she is Pakistani. And my question is that I'm Kashmiri, and I have to ask about my Kashmir. When you deliver your speech, I felt that you showed that uh, Kashmir is a territory dispute between you and Pakistan. I felt it. It seemed to me. And uh, you said that uh, you are giving uh, rights uh, to the people who are living there, and uh, you are uh, conducting an election every five years. Do you think that only this rights, which you are giving after five years, is good enough for us? Why don't you allow outer world to come inside and see what's happening there, as Pakistani occupied Kashmir is doing? Yes, please. Uh, Chris. I think uh, <clears throat> how you started this conference, you're quite right in saying when Pakistan uh, uses Kashmir as an election slogan, not directly, of course, but it does. Secondly, yes, of course, the reluctance on the Indian side to come out and speak. But having said so, all the questions which have come today and in the past and probably in the future as well are all of suspicions, both from the Pakistani side and from the Indian side, and of course from the Kashmiri side, from both the sides. What my Reservation or observation for all of this is that uh, can the Kashmir issue be given a fresh debate in the sense trade concessions, regional talks aimed at limiting nuclear weapons, engaging in talks on water and Kashmir? Because disruption of existing supplies could have a devastating impact on the region and would be seen as an existential threat for Pakistan. The one feature that has never existed before is the agreement among all the world powers that the collapse of Pakistan will be catastrophic not to the world but to the Indian subcontinent. Should India not take the initiative on the bank that the US has far more negative perceptions than what India enjoyed earlier on and India should capitalize on that by bringing Pakistan in as a younger brother, as a friend because it has no choice. So we do understand that the Indian Prime Minister understands the problems, but he finds it extremely difficult to convince the Congress to move forward and discuss the issue on a much more open level. Because until and unless we don't see this, and then of course, India should also be encouraged to take part in the Gavada area, rather than China coming in on the market. India should be coming in on the market and sharing together 
rather than China or anybody else capitalizing on that. Shouldn't that be a fresh uh, debate and a fresh approach to, of course, what the existing problems is in uh, going on in India? Yes, Chris. Some very, uh, yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, yep. Uh, Chris, uh, my name is uh, Ayub Rathor and I'm spokesman of JKLF. My question is uh, 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 to General Mehta. Uh, you know, the, have you seen, you know, the blame game and, you know, point scoring situation here? Uh, I really, you know, is uh, disheart, you know, is when, you know, General Mehta says, you know, the figures and all that. So we request, you know, European Union to observe the attitude of Pakistan and India. Who is cooperating? Pakistan have a positive attitude on this, but have you have seen the attitude of General Mehta, you know, that India is not cooperating. So we request, you know, European Union to involve it and to resolve this matter. Thank you very much. <sighs> very difficult. I mean, you know, I, I, I remember, Britain and America decided to get involved in Iraq a while ago to uh, resolve problems and uh, wasn't the most successful enterprise of all time. Uh, so. My name is Sadar Javed Sarwar. I'm the Secretary General of INSPAD as well as some other organizations. My question is actually I am from this part of Kashmir, like General Mehta said that it was a Pakistani military aggression in 1947. So maybe, you know, I'm right or wrong, when Lord Mountbatten is there and when both of the armies, they are under General Gracie or some other generals, how can Pakistan army can act in this part and this? And it was like, there is a movement, indigenous movement in Kashmir now from those Kashmiris. It was from us. I am a Sardar. And in 1947, how many people are killed? It is more than this figure we are saying, 100,000. From both sides, you know, I am talking about. Then they are saying that Pakistan has done on this part, okay, what was the Indian military doing in Pakistani Bangladesh when it was East Pakistan. And he is claiming here that we have a victory here. Normally with the, a lot of excuses, you know, you should be ashamed of it that you put your military in a country and you break the country. Second thing is there, then what were you doing in Sri Lanka? Yeah? No, no, no. I'm, I'm just finishing my question, excuse me. Yeah. In Sri Lanka, in Nepal, in Kashmir, they have 750,000 troops. My question is at the end that I need an answer that is India not a state which is sponsoring terrorism? We are talking about terrorist organization. Okay. So is okay. India okay. not okay. a okay. terrorist okay. state? I need an answer from him. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to ask him. Much. I'm going to ask him not to answer, but you've made your point. Express your view. Yes, uh, Mr. Chris. My name is Shahid, and uh, I am a common Kashmiri, and I be, I'm a political worker also from a National Awami Party that strongly belong on complete independent Kashmir. First, just to ask to my question before, I just want to say one thing that Mr. Mehta said when starting in his speech. He said, truth is not nothing than truth. Truth is wrong. But I think it's lie, nothing than lie, what he said about the militancy in presence in the Indian occupied Kashmir. My question is, sir, here that we are seriously talking about the Kashmir. When we talk about the India and Pakistan, that we both countries we bring together in the table and discuss about the Kashmir issue, why we always, everybody, why we always forget the China, that large part of the Kashmir is also occupied by the China, and why we never talk about the China also, and why we not bring the China also in the table and talk about the Kashmir issue with the China also. And I think the only solution of Kashmir is complete independence, nothing else. Thank you, sir. Right, thank you very much. I'm sorry if, if I've not uh, taken everyone and allowed them to have their, their view. So if I can ask members of the panel, um, and again, if we only have two minutes each, very short time. And where do we go from here is the, is the question I really want to, to hear from the Prime Minister. 
Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, I'll not be taking much of the time, and uh, since there's very short time left, just a couple of things as as a, as a suggestion, and nothing uh, getting into the debate. There are so many things which can be debated, discussed, and uh, so many answers available uh, on, on record. But in the end, I would like to suggest that European Union and European Parliament should, should use their good offices for the resumption of dialogue between Pakistan and India with the Association of Kashmiris. Two is the stoppage of all kind of violence in Jammu and Kashmir state. Three is uh, allowing the International Human Rights Organization to visit Jammu and Kashmir. A release of tax news, removing our draconian laws, and uh, asking the parties to accept international facilitation. EU and EP should send a good mission to Kashmir. I myself, on behalf of AJK government, I can invite EU presence, uh, I can suggest that EU presence mechanism in Azad Kashmir should be evolved. So with that, I once again, thank you very much. There are so many things we, we, can, we can send through emails and uh, we can go on the websites. But once, once again, I, I place on record my uh, most sincere gratitude on behalf of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, on behalf of the government of Azad, Jammu and Kashmir, for holding this such a wonderful uh, uh, hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, where do we go from here? I've always felt that as a co if you want to have a confidence-building measure on Kashmir, get the UN to prepare and uh, begin to prepare a list of Kashmiris all over who would be eligible to take part in a plebiscite when and if it happened. One. Two, I, I uh, feel that the original idea of a UN-sponsored plebiscite with just two choices has gone out of, uh, it's become irrelevant. There should be a third choice. I think then these are modalities that India, Pakistan, and the Kashmiris need to work. You want to go with Pakistan, want to go with India, I think that nobody's going to, but anyhow, put it in for the sake of putting it in. Or do you want independence? I think that choice has to be given to the Kashmiris. And we have no problem with it. Pakistan should not have a problem with it because we have made a principled stand that we will go with whatever the Kashmiris want. Um, I, uh, this whole idea of redefining the Kashmir issue which PJ Meer was talking about, I think it doesn't really make sense. You resolve Kashmir, you resolve the water issue between Pakistan and India. You resolve Kashmir, you resolve the Siachen issue. So Kashmir really is at the root cause of a lot of the co political conflicts that exist between Pakistan and India. On the issue of Gwadar, a little clarification. Actually, the Pakistan government gave control of Gwadar to Singapore port, not to China. So I think that we need to get the facts correct on that. And one little point uh, in a light-hearted way that since General Mehta so uh, believes in General Musharraf, of you do realize that the latest, uh, because Musharraf is giving a statement a day, maybe two sometimes, the latest statement he gave was that the Indian army is a terrorist army. So would you agree with that also, since you're agreeing with everything he's saying so far? Well, General, there's been a lot of, lot of points directed at you, but um, uh, I'd say I'd, I'd prefer you not to answer them, just treat them as, as, as points. One thing though, that I would be interested in is the the point about the international presence and human rights observers, I mean, one way or another, Indian people, Indian citizens in Kashmir, have been killed, I think, by, by Indian troops. By, by, um, I mean, I think there's evidence of this. Um, whatever the grounds for that may be. Uh, it's a very difficult situation. Uh, even the British, who are, uh, w w w when we had the Northern Ireland problems, as we, to some extent, we still have, we brought in the Americans to help. Um, because no one trusted the Brits, frankly. So, so we, 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 in, or, in order to bring the sides together, the Americans came in and chaired commissions. Uh, where do we go from here, anyway? Well, now's the time I feel that uh, I need at least 10 methods to answer your questions. Yes, uh, but uh, since uh, this hall is not available uh, till after 3 o'clock, I won't take more than two to three minutes. Um, this question about uh, India not allowing uh, foreigners, uh, organizations to visit uh, Kashmir is not entirely true. Every embassy that is represented, including the European Union, frequently go to Jammu and Kashmir and visit, not just visit, meet the military, meet political leaders, meet Mr. Uh, the separatist leaders, meet everybody. There is no embargo. The only embargo... Please do not... And, and the only place they are not allowed to go is near the line of control because 
their encounters take place between people who are trying to infiltrate across the line of control and the Indian Army. Now, with regard to your question about, um, about the killing by Indian troops, as I said in my closing remarks, that if Pakistan were to suspend, I'm not saying end, suspend cross-border infiltration, you will find that killings will come down by 50%. Uh, in, in 2002 and 2003, as part of an agreement between India and Pakistan, when infiltration came down by 50%, so did the levels of violence, and so did the levels of killings. Part of the killings are because these civilians get caught in the crossfire. And these attacks are organized in such a way that they must involve the killings. And I say this uh, with, with a sense, deep sense of regret that uh, a lot of civilians get killed because of the crossfire. Now, um, I agree with the, the, the uh, suggestions made by the Prime Minister of uh, Azad Kashmir that uh, we must take measures to end violence immediately um, in, in Jammu and Kashmir. But even more important than that, uh, or equally important is for India and Pakistan to resume their dialogue and get Kashmir, discuss Kashmir as a priority basis. I can tell you this, that as part of my Singapore dialogue, um, we have actually questioned, I mean, I'm now not talking about government, but I'm talking about track two. We have actually, one of the sessions we hold every year is, has bilateralism failed? Now, the government of India's position is very clear. It is it's embodied in the Simla agreement. It is embodied in the Lahore agreement that there is no third party. But we in track two, are saying that if bilateralism has failed, do you need somebody else? Who that somebody is, uh, is for the three parties to decide, principally for India and Pakistan to decide. And again, I would suggest, and I passionately believe this, and I have no love for Parvez Musharraf, because for as long as he was the president of Pakistan, I was not issued a visa. For 10 years or nine years, I was denied a visa to Pakistan. And I, that's another story I, I, I can share with you during uh, the juice break. But uh, so I'm, I'm, no, I'm no lover of, but it, is, it has to be recorded that the best period of India-Pakistan relations was during his time. We had a ceasefire on the line of control, unprecedented. Never in the history of India-Pakistan relations did you have a ceasefire on the line of control. You came so close to the Jammu and Kashmir solution. Therefore, I believe, I believe that it is possible. It is possible that if we put the baggage of history aside, and as somebody said, and I again agree with Mr. Meir, that uh, we have to think of fresh issues. And again, if I can go back to my conference, we are now talking not so much about Siachen. Siachen will happen the second day. If, if, you, if you can get a, a good agreement on Kashmir, Siachen, Sir Creek can be signed within 30 seconds. There's no problem. And so in our track two, we are thinking about new issues, Afghanistan, water, trade, environment, all these issues which are plaguing India-Pakistan relations. But I'll end on the note that I thank Chris Davis that you provided an opportunity at least to make this plea from the Indian side, I am saying, we would want this Kashmir issue resolved immediately and expeditiously. Thank you. Can I make one point, Chris, just one point. Uh, Yes, Majid, as the uh, organizer this. Uh, just, uh, just one point. Uh, I endorse everything the Prime Minister said on the way forward, what we should do. But uh, what was a few years back, Chris, uh, an initiative was moved, and I think all they should take it on, 
is that the, a, com a commission should hold a conference on Kashmir, inviting India, Pakistan, and the both representatives of uh, Kashmir. That may be also a way forward to take this matter. I'd That's like it. I'm, I'm sorry the commission was invited to come here, the commission experts, and they uh, specifically declined. They just felt it was all too sensitive. So, uh, That's what I say the commission should be involved in. Well, I, 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 I entirely agree. Um, Eva, I asked. I will try to squeeze it in one, one minute. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Meta to be so courageous and to enter in this kind in this debate. And uh, you were really on uh, uh, keeping uh, uh, this this debate on in in in, uh, in a very fair uh, manner. And I think that I should uh, thank also uh, everybody in in the audience who accepted this tolerant. Uh, and a very, very, uh, I would say, productive uh, way of, of exchanging, exchanging the, the, the views. I think uh, uh, the point that uh, European uh, Parliament and European Commission should try to play a role, or at least to <coughs> contribute to the solution, this is a good point, and, and this, this is something we definitely should promote. I think also that the, the, it has been uh, recalled the principle of self-determination. I think this, this principle is extremely important and it, it valuable also for, for Kashmir situation. So I am grateful to everybody who, who, who uh, recalled this, this principle. I don't believe that, that, uh, that uh, any solution could be found without the uh, without, uh, inclusion of the, of, the, of the people who are living uh, in Kashmir and without uh, them being ready to accept it, each other, to respect the differences and to, to create a, co a common life. We should maybe in the European Parliament try to focus on this uh, aspect of the problem uh, even more than we did we did uh, ever since so i am also a little bit skeptical about the bilateralism yes. in, as as the only way it is a, a dimension which is definitely needed for the for the for the for the for the solution of the problem but not the only one so so i think uh, uh, these conferences also uh, shown that there are there are many dimensions which should be taken in consideration and let me just add one small thing i uh, i am uh, i have an experience of of uh, former yugoslavia falling apart there are some similarities with the situation in bosnia and herzegovina yeah. def definitely and there the, the, this uh, country bosnia and herzegovina is on the in the process of of healing uh, so maybe, maybe there are some things which we can study and 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 implement uh, uh, out of this of this experience which happened here in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I, can I just echo for your tolerance and participation, and I thank all our speakers, and I'd be grateful if you would show your appreciation. Thank you. Thank you for coming.